statistics and jump into numbers. And we're not going to miss a beat because it's the trials of the wilderness. Are you with me? So we're learning. I'm learning. We're all learning. Rick's learning. We're learning about the second edition of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Did you know there were, t there were two publications? <laughs> the first edition and the second edition. It was a popular work, wasn't it, Rick? Yep. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Great God and Father, Lord, we love you. And Lord, we're just studying here about the Israelites. It's a great study. Lord, we see ourselves in this text. We're living it out. Lord, we long for heaven. We know that this life has many trials and tribulations, God. And Lord, uh, we have many weaknesses. Lord, it's true. We're, we have weaknesses, and we're not realizing our potential all the time, God. We're not at the pinnacle. Like Paul said, he didn't consider himself as having arrived in Philippians chapter 3, but he just keeps pressing on and uh, forgetting the past, pressing on to the future. Lord, we want to be that, like Paul, we want to be that kind of Christian and keep pressing on to heaven. And Lord, uh, we give you our past, you hold the future. Lord, where we live and we believe, we act in the present. So God, just help us today. Lord, I pray a special blessing on our mothers, Lord, what a godly uh, task, what a godly work, a godly role. And as I search the scriptures, Lord, uh, this week on all the, the passages, Lord, not all of them, but many passages dealing with mothers and fathers and children. Lord, God, how, how important this, the preaching is on godly motherhood that we need today. Lord, we ask a special blessing on Blake. He's been such a great brother in Christ and a great help to our church, fellowship, and with the young people. He's, he's given so much, uh, Lord, to you, and we just pray that you will bless him. And Lord, we know it's not the end of our relationship. It's just the beginning of great works that are done for you in your name. And we pray these in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, Rick. Exodus 34, take it away. You know, I got an old paper Bible. Mm -hmm. We got electronics. Is the PowerPoint behind us? No? The screen? You want me to read? And the Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. All right, uh, what comes to mind? Well, I have something funny in my head. Has, have you ever heard of a religion that claimed to have a divine revelation? And whoop, they lost it, and they said, Well, if you're a prophet, you can reproduce it again. And they're like, uh, uh, What if we didn't lose it? What if somebody stole it and they're testing to see our prophethood, our prophetship? Did you know that really took place, that story? It was the Book of Mormon. And, and, and Joseph Smith claimed to have this divine revelation written down, and he needed the financial backing of Martin Harris, a farmer who mortgaged his farm to invest in this you know, Book of Mormon enterprise. Well, his wife, Lucy, was furious and said, let me see that. And Joseph Smith was away. I can't remember if he was away and they took it or maybe he gave it reluctantly to Martin Harris who gave it to his wife Lucy and she took it out and hid it and said, I lost, I threw it in the fire, she said. Well, 118 pages of the Book of Mormon and she says, if you're a prophet, you can reproduce it, <laughs> word for word. And they're like, Ugh. we got Solomon Spalding's novel. We can't reproduce that. How are we going to reproduce 118 pages? Well, if you're a prophet from God, God okay. said, the Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Yep. If you are from God, you should be able to do it. God can do it. The prophets can do it. Mm -hmm. Joseph Smith couldn't do it. <laughs> wow, that was nice. Huh? 
called no, him I'm out just, on you're, it. You're, you're, when you read a verse of scripture, you can't help but compare and contrast mm -hmm. the fallacies of the world. Can you guys hang with the fallacies? Can you see through the fallacies and the baloney? We don't ever know what happened. So can you imagine a divine revelation and you're reading in the Bible and all of a sudden it comes to an abrupt halt and they had to get their Urim and Thummim and wait a minute, wait a minute, um, um, it's coming through. Thus saith the Lord to my servant Joseph in Sydney, shame on you for losing my, my divine revelation. Uh, I'm going to have to backtrack and skip over that passage and we're going <laughs> to give you a new revelation. <laughs> They couldn't reproduce it. And in the Doctrines and Covenants, what's so funny? What? God reproduced the testimony. Yeah. Moses broke it. At least, you know, he, he broke it in righteous anger, right? Mm -hmm. Was God happy about that? All right. So be ready. Let's go. Go, go ahead, Rick. Mm hmm so be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the mountain, on top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you. Let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. So he got two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. All right, go back to third, chapter 31. Keep your finger there. Go back to 31, uh, verse 18. I want you to see something. <clears throat> we're, talking about cre we're talking about creation. You know, I am the Lord your God. We're talking about the Sabbath day. And what did the Sabbath day say? Work six days and rest one day. Why? Why? Look at Exodus 31, 17. Did you know that creation is in the Ten Commandments? It was in the Sabbath. Now, just because the Sabbath is obsolete today, the Sabbath has been made obsolete, because every day, now, if, if our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, then every day is a day of worship. All right? That's why the Sabbath is, the Sabbath is a picture of the rest of God, the eternal rest, our heavenly rest. And we get a down payment of that, because our, our affections have been seated in the, uh, heavenly places. Our, our affections have been set in heaven. We're made to sit in heavenly places. But in Exodus 31, 17, the Sabbath, look at this. It's a perpetual covenant, uh, a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So creation's in the Ten Commandments. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with whose finger? Moses's? God's. Written with the finger of God. Mm. All right. So we didn't appreciate my Martin Harris illustration, but who are we dealing with? Do we have respect for the authority of the word? Did they respect the tank? What did, what did they do with those tablets, by the way, the second set? Where did they put them? Do you know where they put them? In the Ark, in the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. In the Ark of the Covenant. You know what else was in the Ark of the Covenant? A pot of the manna they scooped up, mm -hmm. the bread of life. And there was one other thing Rick and I were studying, we're going to get to in Numbers. There was a fight over who the preacher was. You know, Everybody's holy. Everybody's a preacher. Mm -hmm. Remember that? And they had, they, and Moses said, everybody put your stick in. And Aaron put his stick. Who is the priest of God? And God said, one of them, I'll show you who's the, who the high priest is. And remember, all of a sudden, this dead walking stick. Mm -hmm. A staff. Staff. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he sanded it down, whatever. You know, they, sure, they engraved worn them. Yeah, after worn, after they time. engraved them. I mean, they were like, mm -hmm. they were not just walking sticks, but they were, I don't know what you call them. something in it, something that was a uh, to be handed down like an See, heirloom. Yeah, typically, an he's heirloom. presented as something in about about the height of, of of the man who carries it, rather sturdy. So not just for walking, but to lean on, probably could use it as a weapon if you needed to. Their initials, their their identity would be put into it. Their initials, 
the uh, they might have even put you know who the sons of the genealogies on them. Mm -hmm. So it was his identity. It was very clear. He put the stick in because if you put a hundred sticks, who's you know how do you know which is which? Well, the, mm -hmm. you know these were not just something you know walking through you know Skyline Drive or the mm -hmm. you know the Appalachian Trail. The, these had their identity. And here, lo and behold, Aaron's rod had a little shoot come out, a little bud, and there were almonds. Were there mm -hmm. almonds on it? Yep, it produced fruit. Yep, an almond is a fruit. I didn't know that until I had botany. Because it comes from the blossom, which is the ovary. So all of these things, God said, they put in the, ten, in the, in the Ark of the Covenant. All right, now... Are we going to talk about the third, the uh, third or fourth generation, Rick? I don't, I'm afraid to even bring it up. I don't know. That's a, it's, All right, it's, six it's and a seven. Big... Rick came to me and said, "We got a controversy. We got what did you say? Do, a do, contradiction. Do we have a contradiction here. Contradiction. I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble with part of the passage here. We, I need you to. We need to study this because I, right. need, I need to. Because not only for myself, but if someone else reads this and brings it up to me as a contradiction, then I need to have, a, have an answer for it. Rick, what, and what basically, as we look in the track record of all those alleged contra controversies and contradictions, when we came to an apparent contradiction, mm -hmm. an alleged, what did we, what, what, what's our experience, the history of that, when we would deal with that? What did we discover? That when, when we come up with with uh, something that sounds like a contradiction, something where he sees like, well, hell, he he, he, see, he sees says this here, but it's now it seems like he's saying the opposite here or something like that. Then, you know, it it pretty much works out that there's a problem with our own interpretation, our own understanding, our own base of knowledge, and how we either read it, comprehend it, um, or just you know uh, in, interpret it and. Um, if there seems to be a contradiction in the Bible, that is, uh, should be a sign to any good, you know, God-loving, God-fearing Christian that you need to study this more. Because there's something you're missing if you think there's a contradiction. Because God's word is absolute and it doesn't mm -hmm. change. And uh, you need to find out, you, ne you need to, to sort of amplify your own understanding of the word of God. So... You know, it, it, it's, it's an opportunity. Like what you think is a contradiction is an opportunity for you to have a deeper understanding of the word and to develop a greater love of truly um, enduring with steadfastness that dive it into the word so that you have that understanding. And what, and what we also found, Rick, is that oftentimes <clears throat> there was an important nugget of truth to take away. Mm -hmm. That there was an explanation. And even in that explanation, the glory of God was revealed. Mm -hmm. But it takes two or three perspectives to be able to get the dimensions of the gravity of the, of the authority and the, and the veracity of the Word of God, the glory, the revelation. All right, so let's say verse 6 and 7. Uh, you know, here's Moses. God has a special, unique relationship with Moses. Is there any doubt that, God, that Moses is God's man? He's not perfect. You know, he struck the rock. He intercedes with God. God allows him. God allows Moses to intercede with him. Mm -hmm. And God will actually acquiesce to some of the things Moses is saying. I'm amazed that the, the, the power and the influence that Moses had in that, the dynamic of his relationship with Yahweh, God the Father. Mm -hmm. And so it says in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, the Lord passed before him. Uh, well, the, uh, back in 5, the Lord descended in the cloud, stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And proclaimed the name of the Lord. Who's proclaiming it here? It looks like the Lord's proclaiming his name. But Moses is with him, came down in the cloud, the Lord passed before him, proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. I mean, these are characteristics Mm -hmm. keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, by no means clearing the guilty. All right, Rick, what does mm -hmm. it say? Visiting what? Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Yeah, that bothered you, didn't it? Mm-hmm.
to visit the iniquity of the fathers upon what? The children, the children's children, to the third and fourth generation. So to the children, the grandchildren, what does that the great-grandchildren, and the great-grandchildren. What, great what does it mean to visit the iniquity? What does it mean to visit the iniquity? Do we have punish? You go back in uh, uh, does, does, Exodus does, 20. Well, let's get some does, cross-references. Does, yeah, I was gonna say, well, I was Exodus say, does, 20. Does anybody understand why that, why that bothered me? Uh, go back to the Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. Does everybody know why Rick's bothered? If you understand why Rick's bothered, raise your hand. All right, one, two, three, four. What's the question at hand? Well, you got to I'm sorry, turn with us to Exodus 20. And the Ten Commandments, because he the, this isn't the first time he said this, Rick. Right. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Interesting. The water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting, or in the footnote, punishing. Mm -hmm. So to visit is to punish. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 23, Oh, I would have gathered you together. You did not know the day of your visitation. I would have gathered you together like a mother hen guards its chicks. You would not. And you put Matthew 24 with Luke 21. I think Luke said, I think it's Luke now that I'm thinking about it. Luke said, you didn't realize the day of your visitation. God visited them. Now, do you want him to visit you with blessing or do you want him to visit you with punishment? So he's punishing here. God's a jealous God. He's punishing the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those, oh, we have some extra information here, mm -hmm. of those who what? Who hate me. Does that help a little bit, Rick? You think God's gonna punish the innocent because of the wicked? Now I know in, I know in life that many times the innocent do suffer because of other people. The wicked, the consequences of the wicked, of wicked people fall on innocent. How about all the broken homes out there? Look at that. Mm -hmm. You know, the kids suffer, don't they? Yep. From abuses of the parents. All right, somebody laughing out there in our audience. Um, like you just said, uh, you know, none is, uh, none is righteous, not one. So actually the bottom line is that we all deserve. Yeah, who is innocent? Yeah. And then, and then David says, blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute, his, yes, impute his transgression. Right. Well, that pretty much covers it, Rick. Do you want to go on? Um, <laughs> and then the Lord says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Where does he say that at? I don't know. I know that it says in Romans 9, 15, it's spoken at, um, but I know that in the Bible we have that. <laughs> No, I know it's there too. Well, actually, it's when God and Moses is interceding with the people. Find that verse. I'll have what? Yeah, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And that's in Romans nine fifteen. And do you have your footnote? New Americans should give the uh, cross reference. Yeah, Exodus thirty three nineteen. Thirty three nineteen. All right. Well, that's when Moses says, "Give, show me your glory." That's last week. Exodus thirty three nineteen. He said, "I will make all my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious." That's the mercy part. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Yeah, God reserves the right. You know? God reserves the right. Mm -hmm. Is it predestinated? Well, there's a what and a who. You predestinated the plan that we all will sin, and yet we also predestinated the plan that those who believe will, will be able to be saved with God's truth. He predestined the plan, and if the man gets in on the plan, then the man gets the predestinated and he says I want uh, blessing. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Didn't you say that he wants to shut every mouth? 
Yeah, that's in Romans 3. Yeah. yeah. So we really don't have a voice in that, you know. There are humblest men to that, realizing yeah. that we are in trouble. Wow, tough love from a mother. Woo. <laughs> Mother's Day. Tough love. God's love is tough, isn't it? And if we don't like it, what did Jesus experience on the cross? Jesus had to satisfy that. He had to satisfy those characteristics, didn't he? Didn't Jesus? Mm -hmm. All those attributes of God? We're really dealing with the question of who is God, Rick. Yep. Yes, we are. You know, the, uh, you know, the um, God's, God's love is, is an amazing thing that we, we just can't truly comprehend and calculate. And so, so why wouldn't his anger be equally as, as powerful and strong? And she's in the Hebrews 11. She's mentioned in Hebrews 11, too. Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep going, Rick. Instead of stopping and mm -hmm. speculating, I mean, those are some great thoughts from a godly mother. Some great thoughts. Tough love. You know, there, there is none righteous, so there's really no innocent. Uh, don't, you, don't you say that the love, one of the attributes of love, is a kind of Yes. Now, what I would like to do at this point is we can either go on. I'd like without, to hit. I'd like to hit. Repentance, there is no forgiveness. I'd like to hit verses eight and nine. I want to go back to uh, the jealous God of verse fourteen because He wants them to cut down all the idols. He's going to go on, and He's going to renew the covenant. He want, He's going to tell them, "I want you to cut down the Canaanite idols." God, God just keeps marching on. I want to answer that question because it seems to make God a little harsh here. Or we could go over and uh, you want to just talk on uh, Korah's rebellion? You know, you want to talk about some intergenerational phenomena? Mm -hmm. What happens when God punishes fathers? What happens to the kids? They curse God. So God will say, okay, God's got to be consistent. I destroyed your fathers. They cursed me. I destroyed them. Now you're cursing me. What is God going to do? Oh, I'll let you get off scot-free. No, oh. they're going down. And then the grandchildren. You want to curse God? It's funny to see intergenerational activities. And, I'm a, and, and how, many, how many times today are people making intergenerational appeals? I've never seen so much ancestor worship as mm -hmm. we see today. Well, my grandmother did this. It's always the third generation. Now, on the day of Pentecost, they said that our children, two generations, you know, they cried out a curse, us and our children. And, and Peter revoked that curse because he had three generations. You, your children, all who are far off. Amen? So the curse of the, curse of the crowd at Pilate was, was canceled by virtue of the blood of Jesus, Rick. Mm -hmm. This intergenerational stuff. You want to look at Korah's rebellion or you just want to go on? Well, we, can, we can keep going. Got lots of the, uh, but, um, oh, no, it's, my thought just left me. All right. Think about your yeah. thought. Let's go over to Numbers 14. Just look at okay. this quickly because I don't want to go into all of it. But I want you to see the intergenerational activity here. Uh, was it, where was that, 16? Yeah, 16, I'm sorry, 16. Yeah, number 16. Now we're picking up, see, Numbers picks up the uh, historical account here. It really, Well, you can find it. You can find it. There's the number, the census, then there's some Levitical laws. And really in chapter 10, it, it kicks back into the historical part. And, they, and they, uh, there they start complaining again. Some of them refuse to enter the promised land. <laughs> they just flat out refuse. We're not going in. We're not going to go in. And, uh, you know, they're, we're grasshoppers. They're giants. We're not going in. We're going back to Egypt. All right, now in chapter 16, Korah comes to him, and uh, verse 3, they said, you, Moses and Aaron, you guys are taking too much on yourself. You think you guys are uh, hot shots, you know? You think you're holy, and you think the Lord's with you. Uh, but God is with uh, all. You know, God is with all of the congregation. <laughs> well, he did. 
<laughs> actually, actually, that's where we were headed in Exodus 34. So Moses heard it. Oh, my goodness. Here we go again. And uh, so Moses is so like, you know, in 8 and 9 and 10, you sons of, uh, you Korah, you sons of Levi, is it not enough? You know, God blessed you. You know, weren't you happy being priests? Weren't you happy being church members? And now you want to be, you know, in the capacity of the high priest? Because Moses and Aaron are really pictures of Jesus, the lawgivers and the priesthood. Moses is the lawgiver and Aaron is the high priest. Those are pictures of Jesus. These are offices that really we don't fulfill. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't fulfill it, Rick. We can't fulfill that. And they were jealous and just bitter and the devil, I don't know what else to say, the devil got in. And uh, Moses yeah. said, tomorrow we'll find out, you know, who's the Lord's and, but take your censer, verse 17. So anyway, so in the next day, every, uh, verse 18, the next morning every man took a censer and verse 19, Korah gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle meet, of the meeting. So that's kind of like a church split here kind of having a coup. And all of a sudden, and lo and behold, Rick 19, mm -hmm. the glory of the Lord appears to the congregation. And the Lord says to Moses and Aaron, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a, in a moment. I mean, God is just, it humbles me to see God acting this way. He's kind of temperamental, Rick. Mm -hmm. He's flying off the handle. God is that kind of God. And then they interceded for the people. Are you going to you know, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? And that kind of is a picture of Christ in reverse. You're angry with the whole congregation and one man sacrifice. You see, that's kind of the inverse, right? Korah is the inverse mm -hmm. of Christ. God's angry with the world and one man dies for the sins of the world. All right, so God says, get away from their tents, separate. And you know, we got to do that. We got to get away from people, unholy people's tents. So then uh, Moses said, look, you know, if I die a natural death, or if I, no, what is it here? If these men die a natural death, you'll know I'm not a prophet. But if the Lord opens suddenly, you know, opens like the San Francisco earthquake, you mm -hmm. know, all of a sudden the, uh, what is that rift down that uh, uh, Silicon Valley? San, San Andreas. Andreas. But if the San Andreas fault just happens to open up, swallows them down into the middle of the earth, and they go down alive down into Sheol, then you'll know I am a prophet of God. And it, verse 31, as soon as he's finished speaking these words, guess what happened? San Andreas fault. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't in California. It swallowed them up. They all went down into the alive. Then fire came out of heaven, consumed, uh, verse 35, 250 men. And God's like, get away from that congregation. Uh, he's not done. And, and uh, he took them. Uh, uh, well, what else did he take here? Go up to verse 28. No, no. Third, I'm in uh, 35. 27. 27. 16, 27. Don't, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, did he take their kids too? The earth swallowed them up, 32. With their households and all the men, with all their goods. Mm -hmm. Kids too, Rick. Yep. You, you look at 27 and look at 32. Yeah. And then, and then the Lord said to Moses, you know, tell Eliezer, the priest, to pick up the censers, the censers of the men who sin, and uh, do a metallurgy, and I want you to, you know, hammer them down, and guess where I'm going to put them at in verse 38. They're going to put, fashion them into brass and nail them or screw them right into the altar. Can you imagine going to the altar of God and there's the brass of the censers of the guys that rebelled against God right, in the, right on the communion table, basically. With all your enemies under your feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, hold on, hold on. Now, I would be scared to death. Would you be scared to death? Do we have a godly fear? God we, doesn't act this way we anymore. We need to. We ought to. So what do the people come to Moses the next day in verse 41? You, you won't believe it. They should say, Lord, uh, Moses, we're sorry. You know, we learned a lesson. You know, you, I guess you are, uh, you know, you do have God's blessing. And the mantle of leadership is upon you. No. They came the next day and said, you're a murderer. Moses, you're a murderer. <laughs> says, you have killed the people of the Lord. Yeah. So what did God say? Is God going to be consistent? What if they're kids? 
You know, what if you have a clan in the church and they get disciplined and then the kids are mad and the aunts and uncles are mad? You know, what is God going to do? What did he, when God struck down Aaron's own two sons, mm -hmm. what were their names? Nadab and Abihu. Mm -hmm. You know what God told Aaron? Don't you dare shed a tear. If I see one tear in your eye, it was like when my dad would spank us when we were growing up, and we would be crying, ah, ah, you know, crying, trying to elicit mercy and sympathy, and maybe he'd stop. No, it was actually the opposite. If you want to keep crying, I'll give you more. And oh, I was amazed. <gasps> you know, we could just mm -hmm. push a button and it all went away. I'm kind of like Aaron. God said, if you, I see one tear in your eye, I'll, I'll punish you too. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now all that's been taken away. The wrath of God's taken away in Jesus. We don't know how good we've got it. But you know, what did they do? They just challenged the authority of the Lord, the Lord's choice. You know, we do that all the time. We challenge the authority of president, preacher, parents. Mothers. We are, we are not afraid. Mothers. Mm -hmm. Hey, is God consistent? You've got to be consistent. When we discipline our children, we've got to be consistent. Mm -hmm. You know, if they do something, you discipline them, and then they do it again. You've got to prove it. And so what does God do? <laughs> Here it comes again. Mm -hmm. How about Jesus? When he's coming in, okay, three times he came in to the temple at the Passover. What are they doing? Turning it into a place of merchandise, right? Walmart, mm -hmm. commerce. And uh, what does he do? First year he comes in, makes a scourge of whips, drives them out, comes back the second year. All right, we don't, you got to put two and two together. Comes back the third year, they're still doing it. Can you imagine? Here he comes again. He's, he can't let him go the second and third year when he held him accountable the first year. Every year Jesus came into the Passover, I'm, uh, the scholars told me he, he had to fashion the whips and drive them out. Because the Lord can't be inconsistent. And God can't be inconsistent. And they say, you're a murderer. You have killed the Lord's people. And they said that to Moses and Aaron. Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron. Uh, and this is all after the chorus rebellion. The yeah. ground opened up. Yeah. They're doing it Everyone again. Witnessed Here comes a cloud the, again. The, Here the, comes the glory the, of the Lord. The, the rebels, their same, families, hey, their tents. Moses and Aaron good. come to the meeting. And the Lord, same thing. Get away from them. I'm going to consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces, intercede, only this time it's a little different, but mm -hmm. we won't go there. I'm wondering, I'm just trying to answer your contention, Rick, mm -hmm. you know, because he's going to, I think Exodus 20 helps us, uh, the third and fourth generation of those that hate me. These mm -hmm. are rebels against God. Mm -hmm. so we when, know when, the Lord. When, when, the, when the people come to, come to Aaron and Moses and they're upset, they're saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. That, that's not a truthful statement, is it? No. That these re rebels, no. these no. who are in rebellion, can't really call themselves, and no one can call them people of the Lord. Because they are not with the Lord when they're in rebellion like that. And Rick, I, when we were studying, the consequences of sin, mm -hmm. we, I mean, the stain. Our, little chicken died, our little chicken died yesterday morning. I felt so bad. You know, because of what Adam and Eve and all of us did, nature. That, you know, nobody asked the animals what they thought about all that. They're the, think about the animal world. Mm -hmm. You know, here they've got to suffer the effects of, of death, which is the consequence of sin. You see, there may be a difference. Now, judicially, how God will judge judicially the souls, you know, uh, may be a separate question, Rick, of the consequences. So... Uh, you know, he's punishing. There can be consequences of sin that fall on others. That's the reality of life. The sun shines on the good and the bad. <clears throat> I know in Ezekiel 18, judicially, God said the soul who sins will die. The son won't bear the iniquity of the father. The father won't bear the iniquity of the son. So there must be something else going on here because we know Scripture can't be broken. We know right. there's no contradictions in the Bible. Right. We're just doing that to whet our appetite. It's an apparent but I think Exodus but, 20 helps us. Them that hate me. These are renegades. They're mm -hmm. enemies. And it's an intergenerational enemy. I mean, these mm -hmm. guys are... It, when we look at, at a lot of the sins of the world, what's done by the father or the mother does get passed down. It does get seared into the next generation. Sure does. You know? It sure and, does. And they, rather than learning from the mistakes of the prior, 
they make it part of themselves. They That's make right. that choice. That's right. And and then they pass it on to the next generation. That's right. So, and, and at no point do they make that willing choice to cut it off. You know, so it's, so when, when it's being put upon the generation that does it, and then the Lord says to the next generation, the next, gener next generation, it's because they're choosing it. That's like right. you were saying, we've got this, this bloodline unity that divides the church, causes right. factions within the church. Yeah. And when we look at uh, I don't know, Luke 14, yeah. 26, you can't to be a disciple. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That's right. That these people, even witnessing the, 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 put down the, the war, putting down the, the rebellion by swallowing them up in the earth, still come and say, you know, want yeah. to be angry. Even our but, own family. But, the cost of discipleship, our love for Jesus cannot be broken. Even our mm -hmm. own kids, our parents, our aunts and uncles, even though we respect them, we love them dearly. Nothing can come between the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Because the Lord knows the hearts of men. He knows the decisions they're going to make unless something happens. Yeah. A choice is made by the individual, but, but they're not. Even, I mean, when we, when we see here in this world, we have Christ, and we, there is, there's the intercessor, you know, and we have grace, you know, and, and, and God isn't, and, you know, thank God God isn't coming down here and intervening like he did with, with Israel because he'd have probably pretty much obliterated the planet already. Um, but they lived with God in their midst. And how can you still rebel? How can you still deny the will of God when he is in your midst? You know, and... To whom much is given, much is required, Rick. Mm -hmm. uh, they saw the, this uh, outward manifestation of God, and they were accountable because of that. You know, we're mm -hmm. under the age of faith. Mm -hmm. Now, the generation that had Jesus, they were the most mm -hmm. accountable, okay? We have a comment. Oh, no, just, you were taking, uh, talking about how quickly people turn up on uh, God, and mm -hmm. you can take them out. It's just the next day. You know, there's today, today's the day of salvation, but the next day could be the day of rebellion. So shouldn't wait for the next day, it's today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the next day, people will come and grumble against God and Jesus. You know? mm -hmm. It's Mother's Day, and <laughs> we're not going to let that happen. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. we got some great things going on today. Dear Father, Lord, God, just one chapter, Lord, chapter 34, it's just a heavy chapter. We're trying, to, uh, we're trying to analyze. God, I know that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I know your plan changed, but God, your character uh, is to be respected. You are an awesome God. And Lord God, uh, forgive me if I uh, have been rebellious. And Lord, uh, we, we, we want to have eternal fellowship with you. That fellowship in the Spirit is today and begins now. And Lord, that's what the church is for, God. The table, the, uh, the smiles of loving saints and brethren, the prayers that we have with you because we talk to you, the Word of God where you talk to us, all of these things, God, we want to be we want to be worthy disciples and lift up the name of Jesus. And I pray nothing will take that away. Lord, thank you for our mo mothers, our godly mothers, Lord, my godly mother the mothers that raised the people that are here today. We wouldn't be here without you. We wouldn't be here without Jesus. And Lord, I know the moms played a great part in that role and in that process. Lord, bless us this morning as we receive one another. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yeah.